Our next speaker is Jeffrey Blankfurt. He's a photojournalist and radio host. He made his first trip to Lebanon and Jordan in the 1970s to take photos for a book on the Palestinian struggle that led to his involvement in their cause. He became a founding member of the November 29th Committee on Palestine and a co-founder of the Labor Committee uh, on the Middle East. And he currently hosts a twice-monthly program on the international affairs uh, for KZYX, the public radio station in Mendocino County in Northern California. Please welcome Jeff Blankford. My time is ticking off here. First of all, I'd like to welcome you to the most important Israeli-occupied territory, Washington, in case you had any confusion about that. Um, and that will be proven by the fact there'll be no coverage of this event in the national media, as what happened last year, although C-SPAN did cover the event last year, not this year. Well, the, the Anti-Defamation League I'm going to talk about today was formed by B'nai B'rith, the world's oldest Jewish organization, 101 years ago, last October. It was formed to, quote, to stop the defamation of the Jewish people, to secure justice and fair treatment to all citizens alike, and to put an end forever to unjust and unfair discrimination against and ridicule of any sect or body of citizens, end quote. By 1937, however, it was already in the spying business, providing information to the federal government about individuals and groups that it considered to be subversive. One of them was the first House Committee on Un-American Activities, run by Martin Dyes, whose antipathy to Jews was well known, and among his first targets was the National Lawyers Guild, the majority of his members who happened to be Jews. A decade later, in 1947, it joined the House Committee on Un-American Activities uh, in the Hollywood witch hunts, acting as a liaison for those Jewish witnesses who wish to inform on their friends and offering information on those who refuse to do so. In October that year, hearings before the House Committee on Executive Department Expenditures revealed that the Civil Service Commission, without congressional authorization, was collecting information on individuals who had not applied for jobs with the Civil Service. They were alleged subversives. And they were providing us information, not just the Civil Service Administration, but with the FBI and HUAC. This appalled committee chair, Michigan Democrat Claire Hoffman, when asked to define the groups that had provided the Civil Service the information, Hoffman said, I will tell you that they are smear artists. He was mainly referring to the ADL, which had provided information to the committee and up to 7,000 individuals. Um, Mind you, this was a year before Israel came into being and reflected more the nature of the ADL than its commitment to Zionism. But this would change. With anti-Jewish discrimination no longer a problem, protecting and propagandizing, excuse me, preparing, uh, protecting and propagandizing for the new state of Israel and censoring its critics and intimidating those potential critics came to dominate ADL's agenda and has since. Long before Abe Foxman became the national director, its leadership had already invented the new anti-Semitism, equating criticism of Israel with disliking Jews. In 1971, True Magazine interviewed three top officials of the ADL who boasted of its use of undercover agents. And, and the interviewer said, ADL must have a pretty extensive spy network to do all that. Well, it did. It became evident in 1993 when an unprecedented police raid on ADL San Francisco headquarters revealed that its number one investigator, Roy Bullock, um, he, that's how the ADL's chief spy, there he is, uh, described him, um, was... Um, had, had was taken part in, Israel, in APAC's nationwide, excuse me, the ADL's nationwide spying organization. The uh, majority of the information in his files had been illegally obtained, according to the police, and violations committed by the ADL were so great that the district attorney said there were possibly 48 felonies they would be charged with. At the time of the raid, Bullock was being paid 
as a cutout unofficially for 30 years by a Beverly Hills attorney who was an ADL official, so it would not appear on his records, the ADL's records. At the first ADL, denied even to senior staff members that Bullock was one of theirs. A memo sent to ADL's regional directors simply referred to, quote, information was found in the possession of an individual who is alleged to have a relationship with the ADL, end quote. The memo also attacked reports falsely implying that ADL worked covertly with Tom Gerard to monitor Arab Americans, end quote. That was a reference to a police inspector, Tom Gerard of the San Francisco police, whose earlier arrest for unlawfully possessing thousands of computerized files and Arab Americans had sparked the story in the first place. Well, proof of this was a confidential memo of a meeting with the ADL office, in the ADL office with Gerard, about a Palestinian Bay Area activist and the information that was then sent to Erwin Sewell, the chief spy master of the ADL in New York. Bullock, who worked with Gerard, was being paid $25,000 annually through this cutout, as I mentioned. And he, to, he was, his job was to infiltrate and spy on Arab American organizations and those who he referred to as, in his files, anti-democratic organizations and individuals. Some, like neo-Nazis, militia groups, and skinheads did come under that category, but the majority didn't fit that category. According to um, more than 700 documents released by the district attorney, Bullock's files contain information on 77 Arab and Palestinian organizations and 647 groups that Bullock labeled Pinko and anti-apartheid groups. What Bullock labeled Pinko were organizations from every sector of the progressive social, legal, and political spectrum, from the NAACP to the Asian Law Caucus, United Farm Workers, and so on. Uh, group, um, any group that might eventually take a position on the Israel-Palestine conflict, there he kept files on. The names of more than 12,000 people on whom he kept files that were never released. The decision to make what he had public effectively ended the district attorney's political career. Uh, but then he caved in to pressure from the Jewish establishment and didn't file any charges against anybody. It didn't help him, however. Um, a separate section of Bullock's files were devoted to groups opposing South African apartheid, including the African National Congress, which the ADL vehemently opposed. His surveillance of anti-apartheid activists reflected ADL's efforts to keep information about Israeli-South African ties from going public. Since, as Bullock acknowledged, he was already collecting this material for the ADL when he went to work for South African intelligence officially and being paid for South African intelligence, he was already doing that work. He didn't have to do any more work. His career began to unravel when he infiltrated the Labor Committee on the Middle East, which Bay Area labor and anti-apartheid activist Steve Zeltzer and I founded in 1987. Bullock attended the first two meetings at Zeltzer's house, and, um, and, and he, had, he had infiltrated an anti-apartheid uh, group uh, that was supporting an imprisoned South African labor activist, and that's the way Steve invited him to come to the first meeting, and I had met him because he had infiltrated the Arab, American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, where because of his beefy appearance, he worked as security at their events. Um, shortly thereafter, I received in the mail a page from the Journal of the Institute for Historical Review, uh, which claimed that Bullock, who had attended its conferences, had been working for the ADL and spying for it for 25 years. While no fan of that group, I suspected what it said about Bullock was true. So Steve and I met with him and showed him the article and asked for his response. He denied working for the ADL, but he did say that he had attended the conferences of the Institute for Historical Review. And he'd done so, he said, in order to recruit members for the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, which of course is the last place the ADC would want to recruit members, but the ADL would want them to because they could blame and smear the ADC by saying they're pro-Nazi or Holocaust deniers and so on. Having made some inquiries on my own ahead of that meeting, I asked Bullock to explain why he happened to turn up at so many Palestinian conferences around the country. 
Well, he was an art dealer, he explained. And by coincidence, his trips to buy art, coincidentally, were at the same time that Palestinians were holding conferences around the country. <laughs> well, to back that up, and this is important, he provided references to two art galleries that he said would back him up as being an art dealer. Well, Steve and I realized that this guy was a fraud. He was actually despised. So we didn't bother checking the references, but I kept those references. And so when the Girard story broke in the paper, I thought that there was a connection between Bullock and Girard. And so I called Dennis O'Patterney, who was the examiner reporter writing about the story, and I said to him, does the name Bullock mean anything to you? And he said, boy, does it. At that point, it was only a last name in Gerard's files. And so I gave him the name of the art galleries, and he called the art galleries, and then the story broke. And um, ABC came out, photographed Bullock on the streets of San Francisco, and it became the big story in the local newspapers. And I was attacked in Jewish newspapers from Jerusalem Post, Jewish Forward, Washington Jewish Week, um, for having done that, having exposed their spy. Um, by a twist of fate, ABC wanted to speak to one of the people who had been spied on by Bullock, and so the assistant district attorney, John, John Dwyer, uh, gave them Steve's file, and in Steve's file was my name. So Steve called me to tell me, you're in my file. So I called Dwyer. Uh, it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I said, could I get my file? He said, sure, come over and get it. And I wasn't that far from the Hall of Justice, so I went over to get it. And if I hadn't done that, I never would have seen the file because that night, thanks to an ADL request, the files were closed and have been closed ever since. That enabled us to have a case. Um, the information on mine was a mixed bag. Much of it sloppy, most of it wrong, such as my having married a woman in 1963 who I never heard of. <laughs> it also contained my social security number, which the ADL had no business legally having. And the information clearly had come from the FBI, with whom the ADL has had a long working relationship. Well, attorney and congressman Pete McCloskey, former congressman, himself a target of the ADL, um, he believed we should file a class action suit against the league and that he would do it pro bono. If it was not for McCloskey, we would not have had a case because other lawyers would never have taken this case because it would have damaged their political career. To qualify as a plaintiff, one had to either or support a Palestinian or, or oppose Israeli policies or oppose apartheid in South Africa. Steve and I had done both. Initially, there were 19 individuals in the case. 16 dropped out, however, when they were afraid that if we lost, they'd have to pay court costs. That left, left me, Steve, and a woman, Anne Poirier, who was an anti-apartheid activist in the case. And... Um, McCloskey single-handedly faced down a brace of the ADL attorneys from the, from the highest paid and the largest uh, law firm in San Francisco at the time. We contended the ADL had violated a California right to privacy that was designed to prevent institutions like the ADL from having public information and distributing it to other sources. And, and that's what the courts would determine, that the ADL had taken our information and given it to Israel and South Africa. In 2002, after almost 10 years in the courts, the ADL threw in the towel. On the Friday before the Monday, when the court had determined we should go to trial, the ADL um, offered a monetary settlement for which we would not have to sign a confidentiality agreement, which would have prohibited me from speaking about the case as I'm doing now. And that's the reason the case went so long. We would not sign that agreement. What did the ADL want us to talk about? Well, one thing, Bullock was being paid by the South African intelligence for spying on black South African exiles, and that he had followed and reported on the travels of Chris Hani, a young black South African leader who was expected to become president one day after Nelson Mandela, and uh, who was later assassinated. It didn't want the public to know that in Bullock's files was a floor plan and a key to the office of Alex Oda who is a, the leader of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee in Orange County, who had, Bullock had befriended. And that was in his files, and Bullock was never asked about how he had these files, had the key and the floor plan 
of Oda's office in his files. Um, ADL also wanted to bury the fact that it was operating a national spy network and had seven spies around the country in different, at least seven spies like Bullock working in different Arab American communities reporting information to the ADL. A telling moment came when uh, Pete brought um, Victor Ostrovsky, the former Mossad agent, down to Redwood City for a deposition. And the ADL lawyers asked him to give him the information that he had taken from Mossad when he had left Israel and used it for his book. So here's the, the ADL lawyers asking the former Mossad agent for the, his files from Mossad. You want a connection between ADL and Mossad? It's right there. Um, it was, I don't know, of course, it was logical, but back in 1961, there was a letter from, from one from the uh, head of the uh, ADL, uh, Ben Epstein, uh, which he bragged about how the Israel uh, and the ADL provided information to the government of Israel and the government of the United States. So, uh, and he bragged about that when Joftis, who was the head of the B'nai B'rith, complained, uh, Joftis was fired. He said the ADL shouldn't be doing that, said Joftis, and so Joftis lost his job. Um, the police investigation of the ADL in San Francisco was unusual because the ADL had collaborated, was collaborating with police all around the country, and the San Francisco police, when they went to Los Angeles, which was heavily infiltrated, heavily infiltrated by the ADL, the LA Police Department, the LAPD would not collaborate or cooperate with the San Francisco police in their investigation. Um, the San Francisco police behavior was not atypical. Um, for years, the ADL has been incurring the favors of police chiefs and law enforcement officials across the country sending them on all expense paid trips to Israel. Uh, Gerard had been on one of those trips. According to the ADL's 2013 990 tax filing, 890 law enforcement personnel had been through its, quote, advanced training school on extremist and terrorist threats, and more than 85,000 had undergone training in conjunction with the Holocaust Museum here. Uh, how that was expected to benefit Americans, uh, I, I don't know. In one of his publications designed for law enforcement officials, the ADL boasted that, quote, through strategic cooperation with the FBI, Israeli police, and others, we facilitate the exchange of information and best practices regarding extremist threats. Law enforcement officials at the federal, state, and local levels turn to ADL repeatedly for assistance and value our expertise. We exchange with law enforcement personnel across the country on a daily basis, monitoring individual extremists and extremist groups. It's a scary scenario, but not without its ardent supporters, such as FBI Director James Comey. On April 28th, a year ago, addressing the ADL's national conference, Comey thanked the organization for having trained more than 12,000 law enforcement personnel the previous year, and since 2010, he said, FBI employees have participated in more than 105 training sessions sponsored by the ADL on extremism and hate crimes in 17 states and here in, in Washington, D.C. Your leadership, he said to the ADL, in tracking and exposing domestic and international terrorist threats is invaluable, and the training you voluntarily provide at conferences and classrooms at the community level is eye-opening and insightful. If this sounds a bit like a love letter to the ADL, he said, it is, and rightly so. Reality check, shortly after Comey's talk, Rand Smith here, under the Freedom of Information Act, requested copies of the training materials used in the ADL sessions with the FBI. According to the Justice Department, they couldn't find any. Second reality check, and closing up here, in November 1983, Leonard Zakim, executive director of the ADL's New England office in Boston, sent campus Jewish leaders a booklet, quote, a booklet containing background information on pro-campus Arab sympathizers who are active on college campuses, telling them that if, quote, you need more information on these individual groups or any others, please call us, end quote. He encouraged them to pass knowledge on that they may have on other individuals and groups onto us so we can have a more complete and useful listing, end quote. In a postscript, he cautioned that, quote, this booklet should be considered confidential because it easily could be misconstrued, end quote. 
Among the names were Professor Edward Said and Senator James Aberesk. The booklet's existence was not made public until January 1985, when the Middle East Studies Association was preparing to pass a resolution asking the ADL to disown the document. When questioned about it by the New York Times, Zach Hames said the document had been careless and that he would not have written the cover letter if he considered the matter thoroughly. Given it had been distributed more than a year before that, it's obvious the only thing that Zakim regretted was that he'd been caught. His reputation survived that. In 2002, Boston had a new bridge, and they named it the Leonard P. Zakim Bunker Hill Memorial Bridge, after Zakim and the American colonists who fought the British at Bunker Hill. I would very much doubt that if those colonists were around today, they would like to be linked with the ADL. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.